We are in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Um, looking at the funny picture, children, this is your chance to escape if you want. Are we doing children's church? You know it's going to be a good one this morning. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, before you was Mr. Bean, a funny picture to, to get us to think. Um, well, who do we thank for what's happening here? Who's responsible for this? Um, yesterday I was at my uh, granddaughter's birthday party, and of course we wanted to instill upon our children at a very early age, they have to be thankful for gifts or when someone gives them something, you want to be sure that they thank the appropriate person. And of course in church we have people that seem to be responsible for specific things or we might have, as, as I did at the church in Fremont, um, people who are very financially giving. Well, who are we thankful to? Um, this is a really important idea because so often in virtually every church I've ever heard of, we begin to identify those specific people rather than the God who controls all things, who is simply using those people to accomplish his will. We begin to focus on the one who gives the money, not the one who allowed that particular person to make so much money. Who do I thank for this? Who do I thank for what's going on in the church? Now, before we go forward, I want to kind of review from last week. So from the last couple of weeks, we have begun to see Paul is developing in this long sentence that ran from 1-1 through 1-7. This is kind of the way Paul writes. He just runs a lot of ideas together. Paul has actually already identified several areas where he's going to develop and expand and clarify for us. He is going to talk about how Jesus is the promise, the foundation that was laid from the creation of the world and is evident in the Old Testament that we should know. That makes our faith much more secure and confident. And in many ways, very uncomfortably, Paul is going to talk about salvation Paul is going to talk about the potential of salvation in a way that we might find um, is not something we want to hear, but he's already started to speak of that in just these opening verses. And so we see the big question, and, and I heard some comments last week. Um, from the last couple of weeks, we see in verse 6 the idea that, well, there's a calling and God loves people. And kind of the question that I immediately heard last week was, well, doesn't God love everybody? Doesn't God love everybody? Now, to a certain extent, we do have this idea that there's a general calling. There is a general calling. We are motivated to proclaim the gospel to everyone. And yet, Paul is also going to make it very clear that there are specific people whom God has chosen. There are specific people whom he has, in his way of salvation, loved. Now, let's examine that. He has called certain people, verse 6. He has loved certain people, verse 7. Those people are going to be saints. Those people receive the peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Real quick, we have to understand and see, isn't it interesting here in verse seven, already Paul is equating God our Father with the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying we're not worshiping two different gods. If you have the peace of God, if you have received his mercy, if you have been called, these two things are the same. Jesus, our Messiah, is God in the flesh. We're not talking about two different things. He's going to also develop that idea. 
So does God the Father love everyone? And I have heard this in my few years upon this earth, that the death on the cross covered all sins for everyone. God loves everyone, right? And Jesus died for everyone. Well, now consider what your necessary conclusions would have to be. If God loves everybody and the death of Jesus covered everyone's sins, the necessary conclusion is, well, everyone must be saved. Everyone must be saved. Somehow everyone's going to heaven. They just don't know it. Um, that's not what Jesus preached. Jesus preached more about hell than he did heaven. And I would remind you of a very specific parable. He said there's two gates. One is very wide and it's very enjoyable and it's very easy and most people are going in there. It doesn't eventually lead to heaven. It leads to destruction. It leads to hell and judgment. That's where most people go in. He said there's another gate that's very narrow. It's very hard to go through. Very few people will find it. It's a difficult way. But it leads to eternal life. And so this idea that Jesus died for everyone and somehow everyone's going to heaven, they just don't know it. Um, that's a very hard position to hold if you're going to look at scripture. Okay, here's another answer, though. Maybe everyone could be saved if they choose Jesus, see? And so everyone potentially could be saved. We just have to find the way to put it in the correct sort of program or message or medium because everyone really could be saved. Well, if that's kind of the road you want to go down, then you're trying to tell me, in some way, our will is greater than God's. Again, you're trying to tell me that somehow God wants everyone to be saved and our will is keeping that from happening. Which would mean, if you could allow me not to be blasphemous, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father and he calls Gabriel the angel over and he said, what's happening here? That, that person down there. Philo T. Fenstermacher. He, he just went to that church in series where the pastor preaches from the gospel. And he just made a decision to follow me. He's going to cause problems in that church. He's not going to reflect the kingdom. I didn't really choose him to be part of this kingdom. And Gabriel is going to say, well, you know, that's free will. That's what we've been dealing with for centuries. <laughs> So there are people that are going to come to the kingdom that really weren't chosen, but they chose. Or maybe to put it another way, Jesus sitting on the side of the throne saying, Gabriel, I need your help. That man down there, Philo T. Finstermacher, I want him in my kingdom. He's such a good guy. There's so many skills and talents I could use in my kingdom, but he just hasn't accepted my, my salvation yet. And he's getting older. What can we do? And Gabriel's going to say, I don't know. We've tried everything. Jesus is going to say, man, I really wanted him in the kingdom, but he didn't choose. I'll have to choose somebody else. <laughs> so here in the very beginning, Paul is laying out maybe some truth we don't want to hear. Yes, we are called to preach his message to the whole world. But God has chosen some. There are some that he loves. That love is irresistible. Not on our own are we ever going to be able to connect the dots. Through his change, we are going to become saints. And we receive his peace. Any other kind of understanding means that everybody is loved by God. Everybody has been called. Everybody is going to be made holy. And everybody receives his peace that doesn't match with scripture. Now, I want everyone to be saved. I have people in my family I really, really want to see saved. I pray for my children every night that somehow I can see God's 
kingdom and salvation in their life in an unmistakable way that I might have real thankfulness as I get older. Um, but I'm reluctantly having to, to see this is his work, not mine. This is his calling, not mine. Um, this seems to be very specified. This seems to be clear as we're going to see. Yes, God loves all of us in a general way. He gives us rain. He gives us the ability to live. We have the, the fortune to live in one of the best places on earth with health care and, and, and food and safety and security in many ways. And yet I can see that he loves some people specifically. He has called some people specifically, as Paul is going to make very clear. Those people are made holy by the blood of Jesus. Those people are going to start experiencing the change from their character, fallen character, to the righteousness of Jesus, and they have the peace of the Father. And that's not everybody. Already I can see this in the introduction. So from last week, does God love everybody? Well, in a general way, yes. But part of my praise and thankfulness, if you're here this morning, you need to be able to say, I don't understand this. I never deserved this. I could have never figured this out on my own. In some way, for some reason, before the world was even created, God chose me. He loved me. He loves me now. He's changing me into more of Christ's character. He's making me more holy, and I'm going to experience his peace. And so you're here this morning to praise his name for that. Now, let's move on to verses 8 through 18. This is another long run-on sentence in Paul's writing. Paul loves to do that. He just slams these ideas together. Not so much in Romans. In some of the letters to Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, you, you've got multiple subjects. He's a little bit clearer here in Romans. We're going to begin this morning in verse 8. First of all, I thank my God through Jesus, the Messiah, for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit by preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness that I continually remember you. And I always ask in my prayers, if perhaps now, at last, I may succeed in visiting you according to the will of God. Okay, this morning we're going to look primarily just at verse 8. Isn't it interesting, Paul, as he frequently does in his letters, now's the point where he's saying, okay, I want to be thankful for God to these people. Usually, in his, in his many different letters, Paul goes to, here I am, Paul, an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, called to be, and then he describes maybe the events, to the church at... And then he usually has a statement of thankfulness. Well, here we have that statement of thankfulness. First of all, this might be your translations might say different things. Usually your translation will say first, but there is no second. Maybe a better idea would be, let me begin. Let me begin by thanking God. Now, I am thanking this, in the original word, is an ongoing present tense. It means he's just doing it regularly. He's, he's regularly thanking God. It, it's a regular prayer. Paul is saying, um, I'm praying for you on a regular basis. And in my regular prayers for you, I am thanking God. I'm thanking God. Now, that's a little bit of a, making me feel uncomfortable. Maybe it makes you feel a little uncomfortable. How often do you thank God for this church in series? Well, how often do you even pray for this church in series? And you would say, I'm constantly praying for this church in series and for the people in the church in series, and I'm thanking God. Because that's what Paul is doing. Well, that tells me that's what we should be doing. 
We should be praying for each other and for this church. And in the process, we start by being thankful. An ongoing, regular prayer daily, maybe several times a day. I'm thanking God for the people here at Ceres. Now, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, isn't it interesting? Paul doesn't begin by what we might think would be the expected. If this was something we had done, maybe Paul would have said, I am so thankful you are still following the directions I gave you. I'm so thankful you're still following my teaching. Well, then that would kind of make it more about Paul, wouldn't it? Maybe Paul would say, like some of us, I am so thankful, you know, Brother Skippy is still there contributing so much money. Um, That happens in churches. We are very much aware of who is contributing the money. Oh, I'm so thankful he's part of our church now. Maybe we identify people that seem to be making things happen. They either take care of the church on the outside, they do the landscaping, they maybe take care of issues that are happening inside the church, wiring or plumbing or something like that, or their computers. Oh, I'm so thankful Brother uh, Cisco is here taking care of the, uh, because I don't know anything about computers. We, We begin to identify the people doing the work and not the one behind them who's just using them. Notice what Paul says. He could say, I'm thanking this wealthy person because there are many different types of people showing up to the church. He doesn't identify the movers and shakers. He doesn't identify those people that are elders and leading. I thank my God. I thank my God. Isn't that interesting? He, he's identifying immediately. You may think that you're making this church happen. I know at the previous church I was at, the person who gave so much money thought he was the one making this church happen, keeping the doors open. Wrong. God is keeping the church open. He's just using that particular person. How often we think, oh, I'm so thankful for Marie, because, you know, she organizes all these dinners and luncheons and stuff, and I would be terrible at that. Or we identify the person who makes a lot of decisions. I'm glad I don't have to do that. We might be thankful for someone who has a good head for business. I can be very creative with money. You wouldn't want me doing that. How hard it is for us to say, Whatever efforts are being made in this church, whatever efforts are being made by people in Rome, by whoever in Rome, they are just the people that God is using. They're just the particular person God is using right now. Could he use somebody else? Oh, yes. He's just using them right now. This is all God's work. This is all God's work. And so as we come specifically, let's be a little uncomfortable here to series. Oh, yes, I'm very thankful for John, who, who's got the screens working. I'm very thankful for someone who has computer skills. Um, this is God's work. He allowed John to come here. I'm very thankful for people who can come here and do various tasks around the church, who can straighten out leaky faucets and things. But that's really God's work that allowed that person to come here. Can we be focused as a church on what God is doing? Not the individuals. God is just using them. They're just the tool that his hands are using. That's what Paul is saying. Whatever is going on in Rome, realize this is the work of God. Through Jesus. I thank my God through Jesus. Now, just a parenthetical thought here. When you pray, when you pray, who do you pray to? Do you pray to God our Father? 
in most of your prayers, do you pray to God, our Father? Do you pray to Jesus? Dear Jesus, I almost never hear anyone say, I pray to the Holy Spirit. Notice how Paul says, your goal is to get before the very throne of God, and we do that through Jesus, through his work, through his atonement. That's which leads us, that leads us to God. Some really deep ideas just in this opening statement. I thank my God through Jesus. My goal is to approach the throne of God through Jesus for all of you. Not, I'm thankful for all of you because... I have heard reports that your church is really busting at the, th the seams. Man, I've heard you've had to go to double services. Uh, think about what you would be impressed with when you hear about a church. Usually, isn't that what we hear? I, I've got to tell you, when I've gone to pastor's conferences, one of the first things that they'll ask you is, well, how many people do you have attending your church? We're not running cattle here. This is a whole different idea. <laughs> how many people are running? It's not about how many people are attending our church. Notice that's not what Paul says. I'm so thankful that when there's a lot of people coming to your church. You've had to go to double, triple services. I'm so thankful. I, I'm thankful to God through Jesus Christ for all the programs that I hear you're doing. Man, I've heard you guys have got some really creative programs. You've got groups for quilting. You've got groups for rock climbing. You've got all of these different groups going on. Man, you're a happening church. The local director of missions would tell us, he told me many times, what you want to do is replace your sign with one of those digital signs. It'll constantly be changing the message because people want to see that, man, there's things happening at that church. They've got a movie night. They've got a craft night. They've got to make a Christmas ornament. A lot of things happening at that church. If this was a contemporary letter and Paul was a contemporary church leader, I mean, can you imagine the different things that we think are very impressive? Money. You've got people in the local government that are part of your church. I hear you are over budget for the year. You've got more money than you know what to do with that's impressive. What is Paul thankful for? He could be thankful for a lot of things. We might be thankful for a lot of wrong things. Paul has said, this is the one thing I'm thankful for. Not how much money you're giving, not how many services you have, not how many people are coming to your church. Paul says, your faith. I've heard about your faith. I've heard about your faith. Not the numbers, not the programs, not how many services, not how you're getting along with Claudius or Nero. I've heard about your faith. Whatever else is going on, and there might be a lot of things going on, Paul was only concerned, Paul is only focusing on, I've heard about your faith. In fact, Paul goes on to say, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world. Um, when I run into people from Rome, Paul says, your names come up. This means that ongoing news keeps coming. Your faith is being proclaimed. Again, just like that first verb we looked at, this means ongoing. It keeps happening. This wasn't just a one-time thing. Paul is saying, um, I keep running into people that are talking about your church. Travelers are coming from Rome. And when I connect with them, they say, man, there's a church in Rome. Paul, you should go there someday. This, this is a happening church. Paul says, I'm hearing about your church in places I would never expect to hear about your church. It makes you wonder. Paul is in Corinth writing this letter and, and he hears news coming from Rome. Paul, there's a church in Rome. You need to visit there. Really? Tell me about this church. Well, there's a lot of things happening, but let me tell you about their faith. 
it makes you wonder, what in the world was going on in Rome? Their faith? Not their numbers. Not how oh, this church is really growing. Um, not acts of martyrdom that would develop under Nero. Um, not programs. Not notable people. Hey, they have some celebrities coming to their church. Churches, you know, are famous for many reasons. Mostly in our mistaken world here in California, we are, we're really impressed with big churches, aren't we? We are, if you have a big church, you are somehow, you're like a bishop, although we don't have bishops. At, at the last convention for the Southern Baptist, Rick Warren was given an unusual amount of time to talk about his positions. Why? Well, because he has the largest Southern Baptist church in California, on the West Coast. If you have a large church, somehow we've equated that with you must be doing something right, good things must be happening there, and it must be from God, because there's a lot of people there. <laughs> well, this has resulted in the Southern Baptist trying to come up with ways just to get more people to come into your church. I've got to tell you, it's, it's, it's rather odd. The programs, the ideas are about just getting more people to come into your church. How can I get more people from the community to come here? How can I get more people to think that it's not going to be too convicting to come here? How can I get more people to think that they can be accepted by coming here? And, and already we have been hearing ideas from John Garrar and some of the other past presidents that we need to go soft on some of these sins that are obviously flagrant and unacceptable. Oh no, don't talk about those. You need to accept everybody. Make them welcome. We want more people. But Paul says, that's not what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the faith that's being proclaimed in places I would never expect. And if your church is famous, it's not famous for how many people are coming. It's not famous for who's coming. They talk about your faith. Now you and I are no longer young. I'm not going to say I'm getting older. <laughs> um, I have been in churches. I have been in situations where, unfortunately, it was very regimented. It was very structured. It was a successful church because it was a successful business. You know what I mean? Things were very well organized. Things were working really well. In my few years, I have been in situations where I recognized, wow, something is happening here, and this is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not a good running business. This is not someone who just planned an event very, very carefully and very exquisitely. Uh, this is God's kingdom evident. You might have been in one of those situations. You know when it's real. You know when it's real. And you know when it's just very well organized. Paul is saying, I want to commend your church because I've heard things that lead me to be certain that your church is real. There are things happening in your church that make me confident God's kingdom is evident in your church. Might not be very many people there at all. Might not be anybody wealthy in the church. They might be struggling in many ways. But Paul is saying, I've heard things. I continue to hear things. And the reports are consistent. They talk about your faith. Wouldn't it be interesting to know what, what was going on in Rome? What were they talking about? Now, if we apply that to this church, if people in Turlock, Newman, began to talk about what was happening in Ceres, what would they be talking about? Oh, that church in Ceres, I've heard they've had to go to two or three services. Man, they're, whatever they're doing, they're doing it right. 
Now, that's normally what we would hear. Man, they're busting at the seams. They don't know what to do. They need a bigger parking lot. I've heard that they're going to take the dirt in the back of the church and then they're going to make it a park. That's how much space they need because they have so many people coming to this church. Now, that's normally what we would hear, right? Man, that church took off. Whatever that pastor is doing, he knows how to grow a church. Or, to a lesser extent, I don't know what that church is doing, but they give so much to missions. I don't know how they do it. Or maybe we hear, man, that's a church where they're doing a lot of good, good social work in the community. They're doing a lot of good things. They got a lot of good, good community programs. What would it be like, though, if people in Turlock and Newman, Modesto were saying, I got to go to this church in series because, um, man, things are happening there. I keep hearing these stories. This, this, is a, this is a church where God's kingdom is, man, it's evident. I keep hearing about their faith. You know, as we come to a close this morning, following Jesus has expectations. You, as a follower of Jesus, are expected to manifest his love, to be in the process of allowing the Holy Spirit to make you reflecting his righteousness so that you enjoy his peace. It's not a, I signed a card 40 years ago. It's a, there's expectations. Jesus expects the church in Ceres to be like the church in Rome. Jesus expects this church to be like the church in Rome. Well, what would that mean? People began to talk about our faith. People aren't talking about how few people are showing up. That's not even on the table. People aren't talking about budget issues. I hear that church may have to sell their dirt in the back. Man, they're really struggling. Jesus expects this church to be like the church in Rome. When First Southern Baptist series is mentioned, the next thing that is said is, man, there's things happening there you cannot deny. The, the power of God is just evident. And you know, I'm not talking about rolling on the floor and barking like a dog. We're, we're not talking about that. So the big question is, if, if that's what our goal should be, if that's what God expects this church to be like, if we need people, want people, are expected to have people talk about this church because of our faith, what should this church be doing? What should be our emphasis? What should be our focus as a church? And of course, that means what should be your focus? Because the church can only have a focus that you want it to have that you are contributing to. What should be the goal of this church where people talk about the faith? Well, that's just a collection of the faith that's seen in you. A really uncomfortable question this morning. If you were in the church of Rome, would you fit into this letter? Because you are part of this reason that the people are talking about the church in Rome and the faith. You would be part of that. If that's not your goal, if you don't think that's what a church should be about, if you think it's okay to have other major goals and purposes, I'm suggesting that's not a church. That's not a church like Rome. That's not a church that Jesus would expect his church to be like. If this is gonna be like a church that reflects the faith that we see in Rome, we as individuals need to be reflecting the faith that when combined makes a church of faith. That's, that's all of us. How do we need to change to be a church that's known as, this is a church of his kingdom. There's not many people there, but you come to this church in series, you're gonna see the kingdom of God. These people are different. What would you need to do to be like that? Oh man, that's a hard question. 
or is that an uncomfortable question? Because you know, and you're not sure you really want to do that. You know what it would take to kind of start moving this church towards being a church that's known for its faith, but you kind of like it more as a social club. Realize that there are expectations and there will be judgment. Are you on that path? Are you on the path of faith? Will you be recognized as someone that's trying to reflect his kingdom? And when people talk about you, they talk about your faith. Are you trying to make this church a church that is a church of faith? Or is something else going on? Paul is saying, I've heard about the church in series and... Well, what would Paul hear? Let's pray. Our Father, we, um, we've heard your truth today and we might be very uncomfortable. We know what it's like to follow you. We know the commitment that's necessary and um, we're just fallen human beings and we resist. We're inconsistent. We willfully sin knowing that it's sin and then realize that there was a bad decision after we begin to feel the consequences. We know this needs to be a church of faith. We pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that we will begin to be people of faith that is combined for your honor and glory into a church that is known not for numbers, not for programs, not for events, but as a church that demonstrates your kingdom on a regular basis in undeniable ways. We pray this, not for our benefit, but for your honor and glory. In the name of our risen Lord, amen.